Hi everyone, Dr. Simon Freiler, consultant in clinical neurophysiology, back with the channel. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about the EEG technologies, some of the limitations, and use that as a foundation to explain how we apply this to understanding more about various disease states. So clinical neurophysiology is a medical science where we examine nerve function. And for the most part, it's either minimally or entirely non-invasive. And the beauty is, is we can examine what's going on in real life people in real time, resolving events occurring even in milliseconds, so really tiny fractions of a second. And we can apply that knowledge to understand various disease states, what's been affected and how badly. The EEG was first described by Hans Berger, published in 1929, with the uh, first brainwave activity, which he called the alpha uh, wave. And this is what it looks like in real life. I've described that elsewhere, and you can click on the uh, iCard above to see a greater description of this. Now, the alpha rhythm, I'm not going to go into what it actually represents at this point, but effectively it is a marker of healthy neuronal connectivity. So the next steps really is understanding what are we measuring, what are the limitations of that, and what can we do to enhance our perspective, and what are the limitations of those things. So here is a standard um, EEG uh, recording uh, machine. The leads that go on the head uh, plug into an amplifier over here, get processed by the computer, and uh, with every EEG machine, you'll always find a lamp. Now we put the leads on a very specific way. We use a universal 1020 system using various ratios of 10s and 20%. And we basically build up a uh, map of standardized places for the um, electrodes to be placed. And then we can build various montages um, with which we look at the EEG. Now you can get commercial uh, caps uh, which put the leads on in very specific places. And this is just you know, handy just to show you what it looks like perhaps in real life without people attached to it. Um, but this is what a standard um, set of EEG electrodes would look like in terms of their placement. And this is more of a research type of uh, EEG, 256 lead uh, scenario there from Philips. Um, and of course, this all has to be pre-wired up in advance and you just plug these cassettes in. So what exactly are the scalp electrodes recording? So first of all, we are recording through skull and through muscles, and effectively we're picking up summated electrical activity from huge numbers of neurons, millions and billions of them. So it actually takes quite a large recording field, around six centimeters squared, just to pick up enough electrical activity to cause deflections that we can pick up on the EEG. And so whilst our spatial resolution is poor, our temporal resolution, our ability to, to sample um, in time is actually very good. Now, that's what the situation is like with standard uh, scalp um, EEG. We can, of course, get closer to the action. These are subdural grids, which can be popped um, on top of the brain at an operation. And you can even use these sort of depth um, uh, electrodes where you can really get right in and right up close to those neurons, but you're still sampling from millions of neurons, even with doing that. Now, what exactly is being recorded? So as I've mentioned um, in a different video, we're not actually recording the information of what's going on inside the neurons per se, those action potentials within the pyramidal cells. It's actually these extracellular postsynaptic potentials. Now these postsynaptic potentials can either be excitatory or inhibitory. It's all very complicated, um, and but effectively we are not measuring what the brain is actually saying on any particular uh, topic per se. Um, we are literally looking at a dynamic between millions, if not billions, of IPSPs and EPSPs, inhibitory and excitatory postsynaptic potentials. So I'd like to think about the um, brain and, and, and brain activity very much in terms of seismology. So that's the science of detecting earthquakes. And back in the day, in, um, in terms of EEG, we used to use analog systems, which are actually really no different to this, um, but with many more um, of these uh, little pins, which would be deflected by the um, summated electrical activity arising from the brain. So this is an old uh, grass um, 
EEG machine. Um, and in those days, you would literally have to plug in um, literally uh, pair by pair uh, for each lead on the brain that you're recording and what would then be put onto the EEG tracing. And with a bit more time and some electrification and, and computerization, you could do this a little bit more electronically, but ultimately there was still very much dependent on these little um, markers with ink wells and so on, a uh, rather messy job um, to produce the actual brain waves. But whatever was produced on the piece of paper is what you had. These days, technology has moved on to digital and uh, just from a variety of different uh, sources of manufacturers, whether um, it's your Micromeds, your Excel Techs, Cadwells or uh, Daymeds, and there are others too. Um, but basically, you can have a whole laboratory um, in an amplifier, um, a, a camcorder and a laptop. It's absolutely remarkable uh, what's uh, possible these days. Now, in terms of digital signal processing, we now use digital EEG systems rather than analog systems of the past. In terms of the amplifiers, well, there is a pre-amplifier which raises the signal above background noise. We use differential amplification to improve the signal, reduce noise, and also having a machine reference allows us to remontage after the event so we're no longer dependent on whatever was recorded at the time. Um, Rather, we can change things around at whim. We use a set of filters. Commonly, we use a low uh, frequency filter um, and a high frequency filter to um, either get rid of uh, unwanted uh, noise or prevent aliasing from occurring. We often use a notch filter if we've got electrical artifacts, and that will depend on your country. Um, we use analog to digital conversion. And here, we have to begin to understand some of the complexities of let's say Nyquist and, and bit depth to understand um, you know, how frequently we sample something will have a tremendous impact on how it appears on our screens and whether or not it can be differentiated from, from other uh, signals. And even after you've done your analog to digital conversion, how it's displayed on your screen is also important where we still have issues with Nyquist occurring and even things um, such as how the uh, lines are interpolated between the dots. Um, so there are various ways in which those all happen. This is just a, a lovely little example uh, from Niedermeyer and colleagues. Um, and if you're having a look over here at the frequency with which these particular uh, analog uh, signals are sampled, if you don't um, sample frequently enough, then these um, analog uh, equivalents, which have been digitized, start to degrade pretty rapidly until they become an amorphous blob. In terms of the bit depth, if you don't have sufficient bit depth, then you won't be able to resolve on the Y axis. I thought it would be useful to show you what um, 50 hertz si uh, signals would look like with various um, frequency sampling rates. You can see here at 10,000, you can see quite clearly various shoulders on the uh, triangles. As we now knock it down uh, steadily, let's go to 2000 hertz. So those shoulders become less, they start looking a little bit more angular, but they do maintain their overall shape. At 200 hertz, much more angulated. A very, very different looking shape. So that's Nyquist in real life. What's the relevance of all of this? In terms of the standard EEG, we are taking a qualitative look at certain bands of activities. And we may be overlooking relevant bands of activities, particularly the faster ones. But we can extend our reach by doing power spectral analysis or fast Fourier transforms, EEG source localization, and coherence analysis. Now, at this point, I really have to stress something very important. Good science, poorly applied, ends up in the scenario of garbage in and garbage out. And it's very attractive to be able to apply leads to a scalp, particularly these days when you have these ready-made uh, scalp um, caps uh, where you can very easily attach someone into a machine. Um, and you really don't need to have very much uh, background in neurophysiology to be able to actually do this. 
And in fact, you can take all this data, you can even give it to a commercial company who will chuck it through various computer algorithms to analyze and quantify your data. And then you may end up in a scenario where you're drawing conclusions upon these results. But it's absolutely imperative that those who are involved at every stage of this process have a solid foundation and understanding of what they are measuring, how they are measuring, and what they are processing. And there is a, an absolute plethora out there of good science applied badly. I'm not suggesting for a moment that anyone's doing this intentionally, but it's all too attractive to be able to do this. It's very um, easy to, to now do this, but it ultimately sets us all back. And I always would say that the litmus test for any of these uh, quantification um, type of papers is are there examples of the raw data and traces being published? Because that gives you a very good measure as to what's going on. Let's talk about power spectral analysis and fast Fourier transform. So here you're trying to quantify the amounts of specific frequencies that are occurring in your traces. And so you're effectively decomposing your signals by modeling them against sine waves and you can therefore determine the frequency bands which are present, the amounts of each known as the power, and then you can apply various statistical uh, numbers against each one of those. Now this process occurs absolutely blindly. So if there are eye movements, blinks, uh, tense muscles, uh, sweat, all of these things show up in your power spectral analysis. And so it's absolutely imperative that artifacts are minimized. But you often end up having to take multiple small segments, even in a well-constructed study. And so, ironically, even though you can very uh, easily quantify uh, what's there, you are effectively losing dynamic network information by taking disparate segments and putting them together. Source localization is incredibly fascinating and you're trying to model where in the brain the signals are arising from. Now there are a variety of different models that are used as part of the mathematical solution to this and you can look at various amplitude changes and frequencies and so on but each one of these models have their own assumptions and their own limitations including individual shapes of a head and brain. And fundamentally, almost all of them have got an issue called the inverse problem, which is even if you can determine a mathematical solution as to where the activity is arising from, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you go backwards that you will return to the same EEG signal that you started with. So each method has its own strengths and limitations, and the actual subject of this is, is far beyond just a couple of minutes but it's a very attractive thing to be thinking about when you're trying to work out where something's coming from in the brain but actually it's far more complex than just a simple mathematical equation coherence analysis is another fascinating statistical area where you're trying to work out the degree to which uh, frequencies coming out of different leads in different parts of the brain are similar and are in synchrony. So in this lovely study um, with the golfer, um, when there was greater synchronicity between the parts of the brain that do visuospatial processing and the parts of the brain that do the motor actions of actually doing the punt, when they were more in synchrony, the chances of having a successful putt were higher. That's very nice and attractive but there's always this underlying assumption that the processing or signaling information or carriage of information is occurring at similar frequencies and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case so in the next videos we're going to talk about how we apply all of this science and technology to understanding aging and neurodegeneration Please do support the channel by hitting that subscribe button down below uh, and uh, like and share and so on and see you in the next video. All the very best.